So the Bachelorette had its conclusion this week. After she had had sex with a number of the guys. And the millennials watch and take note. This is how you choose a mate. You sleep with them first. So much has changed over the last few years. Used to be much more discreet and more discretion was put forth in that particular show. But now the model becomes the sewer. I was in CF Fitness working out this week. It's one of the exercise places. My wife and I sometimes go over to the Y. She always goes to the Y. I sometimes join her. (laughs) And we had 15 screens there. Not one of them showing anything about God, but 15 screens of violence. You know, these, all the TV shows, you know, all the TV channels. They have 15 different screens, 15 different channels running simultaneously. So you see Wall Street's greed. You see, um, massive violence being perpetrated on these movies. And anyway, all this stuff going, all the normal stuff that you become used to. I go in the locker room. Of course, I'm going to the men's locker room. I don't know what's going on in the women's locker room, but in the men's locker room, they're swearing like crazy. I mean, just mass of these two guys were there. Full body tattoos, right? The two of them had full body tattoos. This means sleeve to waist to neck, back and front. Full, two of them were there, full body tattoos. And one of them is just swearing like crazy, just the vilest language. Then the the other one screams out, holy SH. You can know where that's going. Which, by the way, I think is just the most, one of the most blasphemous phrases you can possibly use. So my heart was really grieved. And I walked through the place grieved. Huge gym. Walked out within about 60 minutes, the place had completely shut down. Fire alarm had gone off, sprinkler system went in, and the entire place was sopped. And everybody ran out and left 60 minutes from when I was in there. Nothing special about me. A lot special about God and his grieving and his presence and his righteousness and his goodness and his judgment. My wife and I were musing when we used to do marriage makers. We did marriage makers family conferences across this nation, 250 full conferences with tens of thousands of couples. And Sandra said to me, she said, Paul, everything has changed since we did it. We can hardly even talk about marriage in the same kind of way that we used to. Christian leaders, not all of them, many of them have been emasculated spiritually, have given in to betrayal. You say, well, Pastor, why are you doing all this this morning. What's the big deal? We can all relax and nothing else is going on in the culture. There's no problems. But actually there are. But actually there's some huge problems going on. God actually sees what's happening and is beginning to frown on the United States. Now my son and I talked about this. We're going to do something this morning, a little different, in just a moment. 
We're going to play you the top 10 messages as far as the number of viewers and listeners that we've had, both online and here and any other way that people have shared them. We'll start with the 10th one and work up to number one. I do want to include the broad place, which is a spectacular message that David gave. But he kind of did it before we were really counting these numbers. But, and so would, I don't know where that would have landed in the top 10, but I wanted to at least do it. So we're going to play you two minutes, three minutes of each of these messages. CNN ran a clip from an FBI agent. And the FBI agent said this. This was... Last night, the internet has magnified every known vice of men. It started strongly with pornography and now has moved strongly to violence. Internet, social media. Social media, we were just discussing this uh, this morning and been discussing this quite a bit. Facebook, Instagram, United States of America, they are obsessed with self, lovers of self, worshiping self. It's all going to culminate in the worship of a man, the man of sin, who we believe is rising right now in Europe. They fully self-centric ideology is similar, like I've said several times, to Genesis 6, when God destroyed the world with water. At that time, you know, later on we know in the Olivet Discourse that Jesus says that in the future times before the translation, the rapture of the church, and really during the tribulation, men's hearts would be like they were when God flooded the earth. And what what were men's hearts like then? They were, man's thoughts were continually evil constantly. Well, that's where we are now. Self, worship of self. So they're taking their eyes off of any conviction, taking their eyes off of God, going completely man-centric, self-centric. Everybody's looking for worshipers. We even, they even preach a false gospel out there now that God's not angry. He's desperate for you. What is that false gospel saying? It's saying that man is God and God is here to worship you and bow down to you and he's desperate to be your friend. Well, we're seeing it all self, and then, and as my dad is getting ready to talk about murder, it's getting much worse. Social media is a huge influence on that. It controls people's minds, and it's the prevailing thought of the day or the prevailing standard now. Well, what's the standard? Well, whatever's trending that man said is trending, that is the standard of righteousness now, and it's evil. The FBI agent went on to say, the United States of America has mental illness. So the Texas police said this phrase after the El Paso incident, which, of course, as you know, followed the incident in Mississippi, followed the incident in California, followed the incident in Brooklyn where there were killings, 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 and then you had El Paso, Texas, which is considered one of the safest cities in your country. What number? Number six, the sixth safest city in America. So they had a mass shooting there in the Walmart, you know, and that was the second Walmart that had been hit this last week. 20 dead, 26 wounded. So the Texas police officer says this, quote, mass shootings and active shooters are part of this society now. Now at the end of this time, just so you're aware, lest anybody's sleeping through this, we're going to have an altar call and we're going to be up here So, we're going to do this at the end of these 10 messages, well, 11, counting broad place.
So El Paso wasn't where it ended. Are you aware of this? So you know about Dayton, Ohio, of course, right? Dayton, Ohio just happened this morning. Within 13 hours of El Paso, Texas. And nine people dead, 10 with the shooter, because they killed him within the first 60 seconds. It took this man 60 seconds to murder in Dayton this morning. Nine people and to hospitalize 26 more. So 30 have been killed the last 13 hours. Well, I haven't been on the news. I haven't been on, do it, done a news feed in almost, what, 20 minutes. So don't know. The mayor of Dayton said, quote, it's likely to happen in every major city in the United States. So I guess Winter Park would be included. Okay, we're going to go through these messages. These are the top ten. We'll start with Broad Place. It's just two minutes, but it'll give you a feel for the messages we've been doing here. You get a two-minute clip. So this will take us about 20 or 25 minutes or so to go through these, unless I get too long-winded or David has something to say, which I bet he does. But anyway. A broad Place. This was a message from two years ago. Suffering, when one goes through extremely difficult times in life, is important to know where God is and what he is working in us. A study in the lives of the patriarchs Jacob and his son Joseph. How does God view people when they go through painful times in life? This message is a study on this complex topic and how one can carry themselves in the midst of trials. Ready? Here we go. It goes two minutes. This is just a clip out of it. The town is unsettled because they hear a very important man is coming through today. Fear and trepidation is amongst the masses. And chariots and horsemen and soldiers come through. And somebody calls out on the left, bow the knee. And on the right, bow the knee. And everybody got down on their faces because the ruler of Egypt was in front of the chariot, soon to be the ruler of Israel. And as Joseph at 39 years old got down, he stood with power and faith and dignity. And he got down from his chariot. And just recently the dream had been fulfilled that his brothers had all come down and bowed down in front of him. Not one time. Not two times. Three times his brothers bow their faces into the dirt as if God was emphasizing that prophecy. But Joseph wasn't thinking about the prophecy. As he stepped down into the road and he looked forward, his heart and his mind were on thinking of one thing and one thing only. His heart longed to go out to his father that he loved so much. It had been 22 years since Joseph had seen Jacob. As he stood down, he looked down the road. There was dust. And it was swirling around. And then it settled. And then it was still. And Joseph could see down the road an elderly man walking towards him. And is Israel one of the greatest men that ever walked the face of the earth limped forward down the road? He had heard that Joseph may be alive, but so much pain and tragedy and heartache and disappointment, he actually had to see this with his own eyes. Jacob's whole life came down to this one moment. So David's obviously telling the story of Joseph and Jacob, or Joseph and Israel. We're still talking about his family. We're still using his name, Israel. You ever heard of it? That was nearly three, almost 4,000 years ago.
and we're still talking about it. It's in the center of the news. Many messages have come out of this church, and many people are hearing them. This is one we did called the end of the age. With the age of grace closing, what does this mean for us all? Have you heard this one? Have you heard end of the age? I don't know if you've heard the end of the age. We did this one together recently. 320 people have listened to it or viewed it online. That's good. 320. The reception or rejection of the love of the truth separates all things. Here's the scripture. And with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, so as to be saved. Loving the truth is critical to your eternal destiny. If you do not have within your heart a love for the truth, it, I believe, shows that something is amiss in your salvation experience. Something is not there. Something is missing. Because for the believer, are you one? For the believer, everything rises within him or her. When they hear the truth, they go, ah, this is good. Or they leave. Or they leave. Or worse yet, they resist and attack the truth. We see the culture attacking the truth all the time. They, they go on the offensive to get the conviction and the standard away from them because it really is bothering them. Otherwise, you don't see everybody attacking Islam, a demonic religion. Islam, no, they're not going after that because there's no conviction there. It's not the truth. They don't need to get it away from them. But Christianity, the Lord Jesus, yes, we better attack that. Any pro-lifers, pro-traditional marriage people, they will attack them because it's true. And deep down, the Bible says that every person has eternity written on their own heart. They know the truth. No man or woman can actually be a true atheist. They can lie to themselves over and over and over again. There's no God. But they have to do, do a concerted, continual effort to continually convince themselves and others that there's no God because they're lying to themselves. The upward call. This is number nine. We had 400 listening and viewing this one. That's good, too. The upward call. The upward call. The call that brings everything in the believer to attention. The upward call is calling us towards the throne of God, especially now as the return of the Lord is imminent. The pull of heaven is upward and it's irresistible. If you know him, if you don't know him, you feel nothing. You don't feel anything. But if you know him, if he's yours... You feel that irresistible call heavenward. Don't you? The elect, the special, the few. There is a narrow path that few will know. Few will understand. And even fewer will walk it. However, that path is clear. It's understandable to you and I now through God's Word and through the Holy Spirit's light in your heart. Uh, it says, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Paul was talking there in Titus about loving his appearing. Uh, this is very important. My dad has mentioned this several times before, that this is an easy crown to get to long for his appearing. So many times you talk to believers and you talk about any type of end time things and they don't want to talk about it. Or when the Lord comes back and, and often you'll hear and, you know, they'll, they'll say something like, 
Yeah, yeah, that, that's exciting. But first, I want to do this, 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 and this. That's not longing for his appearing. We want him now. Now. We want to be in the presence of God now with the Lord Jesus forever. It's going to be awesome. Uh, we'll, we'll know as we've been known, and, and we'll be with him forever, worshiping him, loving him. And it's, it's something we want now. We desperately want him come soon, Lord Jesus. And we all should be saying that in our hearts every day. Come soon, Lord Jesus. Wonderful. Number eight was the pillars. The great house of God has eternal pillars. The pillars of faith, fire, anointing, resurrection. In this not to be missed series, you'll be strengthened and it will edify every hearer. The pillars had 484. You see, this keeps growing. 484 listeners and viewers online. That's some folks. The pillars of the world collapse. They turn to dust, they decay, they fall. But if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, do you? If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a part of an everlasting kingdom, one whose pillars never fall, whose life and power never gives way to any other kingdom. The words of the Apostle Paul that he spoke 2,000 years ago, and I'm going to read them in a moment, still stand while Greece and its empire are in rubble, and even Rome with its glory is in rubble, and all the nations of the world will be in rubble and decay except the kingdom of God. I believe there are certainly four pillars, probably more, but we're going to talk about these spectacular pillars of faith and fire and anointing and resurrection. Within God's word are spectacular and glorious pearls of wisdom and insight and direction for the believer. In this series, Pastor Paul digs out truths that we can all use daily and lifelong. This is the one where we went over the covenants as well, right? I remember. Okay. (laughs) The covenants. Oh, boy. Here we go. By the way, there was five, we're up to 531 views of this one and listeners. 531 have actually listened to this message. I'm reading from Jeremiah 31, 31. In my opinion, this is one of the most powerful scriptures in the whole Bible. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant, which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declared the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor, and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity. And their sin I will remember no more. The mystery is the church in the middle of all that David has been sharing about. You know your mystery. If you're born again, it's not something that the world can explain. That we have the King, Christ, in our hearts. To the Jew, that just doesn't even make any sense that A man could be God and that God could dwell in a man or in a church. But we're part of the great mystery of God. And as David was saying, all this fulfillment is coming, but the church still needs to be translated. And I'm going to talk about this in a minute. And then return with Christ as part of the millennial reign which lasts a thousand years. Rock of Refuge was the next one. A great theme of Scripture is the rock, the stone, the mountain. In this message, we hear the meaning for us. 
there's a yeah, there's a whole sorts of tons of eschatological inferences. Those well, just those those bring to mind. <laughs> So within a 48-hour period this weekend, we had Good Friday, the Passover, which in Jesus' time they referred to the Preparation Day, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits, and Resurrection Day Easter. So today is unusual. It's actually the day that Jesus rose from the dead because it was a Feast of First Fruits, and Christians are celebrating on the correct day this year. Unusual? Very. Same thing in the fall. Rosh Hashanah will be on the correct day, September 30th. So we're seeing all these things converge in our lives, in the news, geopolitically, and we long for his appearing. Come soon, Lord Jesus. We celebrate the resurrection today and look soon forward to our resurrection in the rapture of the translation of the saints. Happy Resurrection Day, y'all. Thank you, David. A lot of information there, real quickly. So, we're preparing for the ultimate Sabbath rest, as David has explained to us. Number six, and we're going through these truths quickly. Return, they return. This is the women. Return in prepared spices and perfumes. Here's the truth out of this one. The sweetness of God is the fragrance after the sorrow. The sweetness of God is the fragrance after the sorrow. The Lord means for us to go on. He means for us to finish the race. After difficult times in our lives, He calls us to spices and perfumes. There's a lot of interesting pieces in these messages, you know, and stuff we can use, at least stuff I can use. This was a whole series, by the way, that we did on the seals. It was all part of that whole eschatological thing, but this was a particularly one on the, on the seven seals. God's terrible wrath during the tribulation age the tribulation age is described giving a burden for the lost. Do you have one? I hope you do. And an awesome appreciation for the power of the, of the Lord. Here we go. This uh, sermon was probably, in my opinion, the most complex sermon I've ever heard. So many Christians everywhere, and I, I would have to say most pastors, almost most pastors I've heard don't have eschatology correct in explaining Revelation. This is coming from years and years and years of study, years and years of my dad and my conversations back and forth to get everything straight, perfect, chronologically. It's quite, quite a complex sermon, but very important to understanding the seven-year age of the wrath of the Lamb. It's also coming out of the greatest teachers on eschatological issues. Dr. Merrill Tenney was my professor. He, of course, wrote the textbook. Dr. Charles Ryer, you're probably familiar with the Ryer Study Bible. Dr. John Walvoord, you know, all of these greats I have sat under, you know, Francis Schaeffer, I've sat under live all these guys. And so I can't really take credit for knowing all this stuff. I can take credit for taking notes, I guess, and hopefully communicating it to you. But anyway, here's the seals. Thank you, son, for that honor. I appreciate it. This is number five. 675 people have viewed this or listened to this. So we're starting to get some people listening. And, th- and this has been growing as we've been b- rolling these out. We're rolling them out and pe- more and more people are starting to hear this thing. So there's, there's a wonderful ministry, not just for us as a church, but also broader. But something very unique happens on the seventh seal. Something that I believe has never happened in all the history of God. There was silence. It says, and when he broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. 
Think of what was just said. No worship. No adoration. No angelic beings saying a word. The cherubim and seraphim silent. For a half hour silence in heaven. Now all this happens, this rarity, all this happens after the rapture. And most of what we've been talking about is in the first three and a half years of the tribulation, but I've already said by the ashen horse, we're into the great tribulation. The seventh seal, when it's broken, brings out seven trumpets. If you want to hear the rest of it, you've got to get the message, <laughs> okay? But there's a lot in it. Let's go from here to the glorified Christ. The glorified Christ is described in this message, and the message actually brings worship to him in this series. Glorified Christ had 970 viewers and listeners, almost a 1,000. So huge number of people now are starting to listen to some of these messages. I believe when we see the resurrected Christ, we're not going to see some marred form and some twisted, whipped up man there on the throne. I believe he will be in his glorified state. You say, wait a minute, when he rose from the dead, he told Thomas he could reach into his side and he sold him his, his hands, but that was before he ascended. That was before his glorified state where if you heard part one, his face shining like the sun and all the glory, you say, well, what about the blood? Indeed, his vestige, his robe will be dipped in blood. But I don't think we're going to see you wearing glasses when we come to heaven. I don't think we're going to see you with that club foot or that limp. I don't think we're going to see you with that gray hair. Some of you are awake here, right? <laughs> we're talking about a glorified state. And we will see each other glorified in Christ. Yes? Would he be less? I don't think so. I think he will be completely glorified. And we'll understand that his stripes were healed by and his wounds were our redemption. But we're not looking at some deformed, marred, hideous thing sitting there on the throne. It'll be the glorified, perfect, wonderful Christ forever and ever. I think this is really important as Christians to have this view in our mind when we present the gospel to people. I think that this society is presenting the gospel is, is Jesus as he's going through his execution in, in, on the cross. He's not on the cross. You know, the, the, it's important to understand that the God of heaven who created the earth, the God of heaven came down, became a man temporarily in the kenosis, shed his glory, and he is terrifyingly, awesomely beautiful, sp full of splendor and wonder and fear and wrath and love and glory and everything. So when you present the gospel, you need to present it as that you are on your face on the ground like John was in Revelation as a dead man before God. This is what you need. This is the picture you need to have in your mind when you talk to people about God and how he came down and became a man died, took his own wrath, and rose, always has been, always will be. Everything's been created by him and through him and for him. So he saw not some marred thing on the cross. People love to talk about sweet Jesus, meek and mild, and by the way, powerless is, is how it comes out, and effeminate is how it comes out, and emasculated. But actually he is as David just described him. Okay, glorified Christ, thy word. We did the entire 119th Psalm here. I don't know if you remember that. 119th Psalm has a bunch of verses. It's the longest chapter in the whole Bible. But it's not just the longest. It's probably, I think, the most powerful of all the Psalms. I mean, there's many, many Psalms that are extremely powerful. But certainly Psalm 119 uh, was and is and will be. So... 
we had 1,707. This is as of this morning, but these numbers keep growing, of course. But we had 1,707 listeners and viewers to, to thy word. Here we go. Verse 130, the unfolding. Oh, is this a word? The unfolding of thy words gives light, gives understanding to the simple. That's me. <laughs> it gives understanding to the simple. Maybe it's you too. Do you feel simple sometimes? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Unfolding. This word petha, spelled P-E-T-H-A-C-H. It's the most, ah, oh, it's a great word in the Hebrew. This unfolding, it means opening or it means entrance. The root meaning of it means to open wide or unstop. When God begins to open his word to us, it's only going to take us deeper into the character and personhood of God. You know, somebody learns John 3.16. That's a great verse, but that, that's all you ever learn. That's as deep as you're going to go. But God means for us to go deeper and deeper into his word. So the more you know about his word, the more you understand his word, the more you're going to learn about God, that this is not complicated, right? That this is very, very important concept to unstop. There's no stopping to the Word of God. It keeps going deeper and deeper. John even said if every word that Jesus spoke, the whole world couldn't contain the books about it. Now, these last two messages called Final Warning and Twinkling of an Eye we're kind of, I don't consider myself or say I'm a prophet, and I'm not. I'm, I'm Paul David Freed. I'm, I'm, I'm not some prophet. However, I, I think they came with a, a sense, and if you will, an unction of unfolding what God is doing and, and where we're going and what we can expect. And, and I don't think God means for his people to be blind. I don't think he means for us to not know the day that we live in or not understand what is about. So this is why we're taking all this time this morning to go through these messages and open them up for you. This was a very prescient message. It was given on November 5th, 2017. If you remember the great American eclipse on August 21st, 2017 came in, we talked about this. My dad talked about the eclipse coming in. And then event after event with the hurricanes, the murder in Las Vegas, all the shootings, um, the ISIS soldier in New York City. We had six events. And then the final warning. Before the final warning, when we just had a couple events, my dad gave the message, word of warning. Then we came in with the final warning. We said, and we believed that another thing was coming. The second we were done, the second we were done with a final warning, that instant in Sutherland Springs, Texas, a man walked into a church and gunned 26 people down, children, elderly. What was he doing? The final warning went out from a church. And the official response of, not a man, the official response of America was to walk into a church the instant the final warning went out and gun people down. That was America's response to God's word. So, just like my dad said a few minutes ago, the seventh seal was a half hour of silence. I believe we are and have been since the final warning in that half hour, if you will, of silence. Now, we're talking about some spiritual things. You understand that. And, and so it's going to take a spiritual woman and a spiritual man to understand what we're saying. Obviously, all America didn't hear this message, but he's talking spiritually. There's interaction going on in the heavens. It, you know, so, so you're, you're tracking this, right? It, that, that we're putting out, and God's servants, wherever they are across the world, are putting out his messages, not just us. And then the world is hating, in many cases, God's word. And last night re-emphasized America's response. Now, it wasn't in a church, but it shows where their heart is. And it is interesting that that response, I believe, came into a church. 
2,750 people have viewed this. That's a lot of folks now. So when we're saying 2,750 have heard these messages, we're getting out there a little bit. And these are full messages. This isn't a song where you get a, you know, you get a two minute or four minute song that they get a bunch of viewers. This is full 60 minute messages. All right, getting this kind of listening. Okay, let's listen to the final warning. You got your, you got your seatbelt on, right? Okay, because this is not light stuff. Here we go. I believe we stand at the most critical juncture that anyone in this room has stood in their lives. I think we stand at the most critical juncture that this world has seen in over a thousand years. Try two thousand years. My dad and I have been discussing what is to be said today for many, many years. We saw it so clearly as if it was actually happening in our eyes years and years and years ago. And now it's here. Now it is upon us. The Lord Jesus said that at the second coming, those days would be like the days of Noah. And I feel like right now, it's very similar. What were the days of Noah like? The Bible said that man's thoughts and intents were evil continually. Not to mention all the unbelievable wickedness we see flaunted in God's face over and over every day in the news. There are other things. The Apostle Paul said at the end times, men would be lovers of self. We have people that are so obsessed with themselves and pride and arrogance and self-lovers continually thinking about this all day long, every day, evil continually, just like the days of Noah. If you're a true believer, everything in your heart should be saying, he's now talking to me. If you're a true believer, what should be your stance to what you've heard? It should be humility. Humility. Gentleness and brokenheartedness and a softness of heart. It should be humbleness. We're dust. Just dust. Just dust. Humbleness. He's all in all. It should be a response of prayer. There's always a call to pray. There's always a call to prayer. Your response should be vigilance as the watchman on the wall, calling all to warning. Our response should be carrying the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We will have a chance to pray, by the way, today when we're done after hearing some of this. Done 212 messages, David and I have. I did most of them, but David's done a slew of them as well. And we're picking out 10 of them. Last one is called Twinkling of an Eye. This is very much a different message than any of the others in the sense that this is talking about what it will be like three or four hours after the translation here on earth. What a moment. Now, that moment is coming, I believe, in our lifetime. And for those around us, they will be dealing with this. You want to read it? What does it all mean? What actually happened? Probably the most important question is, what's next? Frightening and unsettling is putting it mildly. We all need answers, and everyone seems to have their own opinion. However, accurate and real replies are critical. Listen, beware, and respond. You can't imagine the impact this thing has had on people's lives. I mean, people are literally buying this message and putting in their home for their children 
or their grandchildren or their parents that might be left behind to, to listen to. They're buying this thing and getting it out. They're, they're spreading this around because they want people to understand. I, I know there was the Left Behind series. I understand that. I've read all the books, all 20 of them. But this one is kind of an update on that, the, the, this message. Now, we put it to music. Now, sure enough, 5,000 people have now listened to this. As of this morning, 100 more this week listened to this message. 5,030 have now either viewed it or heard it. So we're going to give you on this one, because it's number one, and because so many people have heard this, and it's getting out more and more, we're going to play two separate clips for you. And at the end of this, I would like you to come up and pray. Now, if you know Christ, you're not going to be here for this mess. But you might know someone that will. Now, this is a worldwide event. This isn't something local. You say, well, everybody I love right here is what's happening. But this is happening across the earth. There's the final rising of the church. In other words, all the church is now gone. All the church. And that's gone forever. There will never be another Christian ever again to walk the earth. Christianity is finished. This grace has ended. The age of grace is over. We are back into Old Testament times, but much, much different and much, much more difficult. We are in now the most dark, difficult time the world has ever seen, ever will see. And you need, it's very important that you listen to every single thing that we say very, very carefully. The graves are empty. Christian graves are empty. The lost are still in the grave, are still in decay, are still waiting torment. But the Christian, from the Apostle Paul and the first century Christians, from those that were martyred, from those that gave their lives, for those that just died in their beds peacefully in the first century or the 10th century or the 20th century, all the graves of the Christians are now empty because they have gone up first. They went up even before your loved ones that you just saw or you experienced the fact that they were gone. All the redeemed left instantly. It wasn't a slow thing that we just experienced. This was instantaneous. And so they all have resurrected bodies now. They have a perfect, perfect body, and they're in heaven with the Lord. Before we listen to the second part, come on up if you want to pray with me. This church has been a blessing. This church has given me access, and David, access to speak God's word. You've protected it and prayed for us. So it's not a light thing when you talk about touching this many people's lives, because if one person's hurt, he's probably talked to several others about it. We talk about repent. We talk about rejecting the mark, being blameless. But I would say, lastly, and very important, you're looking upward. You're looking towards Amen. the return of the king. You have to believe. This is not a believing with just your mind. It's not a believing with just your thoughts and your intellect. You have to believe you have to have assent, emotional assent. You have to believe with your mind and believe with your whole will and your whole being. I say believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross and he took the wrath of God. He took his own wrath. And if you absolutely believe with all your being, you will be saved. You have to live for him. Now, if you believe, this means that you will most likely be executed for this. It is very important, as we just said, that the Lord God, the Lord Jesus is returning. When you believe, you have to understand that you are not worthy. The the king is returning. In Hebrew, the word for the anointed one is Mashiach. But the Hebrew word for king is Melech. And that's a good one to think of because the king is returning and you are not worthy. 
and you have to go out there and, and prove that you're saved with works and show that you are getting the earth ready for the return of the king. The king is returning. Call for him now. Start it right now for him to return. Be requesting with all of your heart and prayer and soul and mind that he would return. And then I would say, we would say, to join the great roar of heaven's worship. The Lion of Judah is coming back. He's coming back soon. And he's coming back in ultimate victory. It's worth your life. It's worth anything you could possibly give to not enter into the gates of hell, but instead to be found faithful, whatever that costs you, as the king returns. Let's take a knee. As we're praying, we're praying for the lost. We're praying that we can be good witnesses during the time we're here. And we're praying for these messages as they go out, that there really be a platform here to get these messages far, and the effect would be huge. I'm going to ask if David won't pray, and I'm going to close in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you. Lord God, thank you for who you are. Lord, we trust in you. Lord, you are altogether very, 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 very awesome. Lord, we pray that you prepare our minds and hearts for what's coming on this nation quickly. Your judgment is coming. There's nothing we can do to stop it, but we can prepare our hearts. We can get right with you for the things that we need to. Lord, I pray that as we get closer and closer to the translation, Lord, our glorious redemption, the wonderful, wonderful hour, the wonderful second, the wonderful split second, when our whole lives and the whole church and everything the church has gone through is instantaneously redeemed, victorious. All the pain, the suffering, the trials, the tribulations is instantly rewarded as we are in your presence forever. Lord God, we trust in you. We just pray for your glory. We pray for your great name, Lord God. The Bible says that the Lord's name, your name, is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. And we run into your name today, Lord God, Lord Jesus, and we are safe. Yes. Lord, we thank you for these moments we could be together. We thank you for your word that you've given us so richly. And we pray now that you would protect your word, watch over it, to perform it. Watch over your people for the moments we have left. Lord, bring the final harvest in. And Lord, may your word go forth eternally. In Christ's name, I pray. And Lord, I thank you for this place where we've been able to fellowship and speak and get your word out. Bless us. Bless us, Lord, with your truth and your goodness, your life, your word, your very presence. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Lord, watch over you. It's been good to be together.